Hello anatomy and physiology lab geeks. Welcome to your reproductive anatomy lab. In this lab we're going to learn about both male and female reproductive anatomy using the Atlay dissectable human torso. We're also going to use this fabulous Hubbard Scientific uh, model from the 1970s that has a model of the male and female pelvises. Now in order to make this lab a little bit more entertaining and a little bit more fun, we're actually going to integrate a Socrative quiz into the lab activities. So in order to participate, you need to go to Socrative.com and then click on Student Login. For student login, all you need to type for the classroom name is NADLAB, N-A-D-L-A-B, all one word. And once you do that, it may ask you for your name. If so, type your name in there if you're in my class. If you're not in my class and you still want to participate, fine, just type in a made up name. It doesn't really matter. At the end of the quiz, you'll get to see how you did and how you're understanding the reproductive anatomy that we're covering in this class. Okay, what you can see right here is we have that Hubbard Scientific uh, sagittal section through the male pelvis. Now, it's already labeled. This is already in your lab manual, so I'm not going to go through each little bit of anatomy here. You should go ahead and study that. That being said, we're going to use this as a jumping off point to talk about the functions of the male reproductive system. The male reproductive system has basically five functions. Firstly, it has to produce gametes. Remember, the male gametes are called spermatozoa or sperm, and they're made down here in the testis. The second function of the male reproductive system is to make the male hormone testosterone. And testosterone, just like sperm, is made down here in the testis. Now testosterone is important for the maturation of the sperm. It's also important for the male libido or sex drive. And it's also important for establishing male secondary sex characteristics, such as growth of hair and muscle and stuff like that. Okay, so that was one and two. What was number three? Okay, number three is the male reproductive system has to produce uh, seminal fluid. As it turns out, a lot of the ejaculate is not actually spermatozoa, it's other things. And this seminal fluid is produced by three different glands. One of which you can see right here is the prostate gland. Okay, makes an alkaline uh, nutrient rich solution there. We also have the uh, seminal vesicles, which are back here somewhere. And then there's another tiny little uh, gland down here, if I'm pointing to it, called the bulbourethral gland or Cowper's glands. All of these glands help to produce uh, different parts of the seminal fluid. Okay, what else does the male reproductive system has to do? Well, we have to get an erection. That is, we have to have an erect penis in order for copulation and intromission to occur. Intromission sounds like the break in between a movie. It's not. Intromission is actually inserting the penis into the vagina so that we can have ejaculation. So in order to have intromission, we need a penis, and that penis needs to become erect. And that erection is caused by this erectile tissue here called the corpora cavernosa, as well as the corpora spongiosa to some degree as well. So that helps get an erect penis under parasympathetic stimulation. And then the last function of the male reproductive system is ejaculation. Uh, we have smooth muscle contraction uh, within the ductus deferens and also within the epididymis, which advances the spermatozoa through the ductus deferens, their vas deferens, into the prostatic urethra and eventually out the uh, spongy urethra into the vagina. So all of this has to happen relatively quickly and synchronized. All right, now that we've covered the Hubbard Scientific uh, male reproductive anatomy, let's take a look at the male reproductive anatomy on the Atlay uh, dissectable human torso model. So what we have here up front is the penis. Remember the penis was the organ of intromission for males. That's where the erection comes from. At the tip of the penis there is what we call the glands. The glands is an important area because it contains lots of nerve endings, which are important in male arousal and sexual response. Now let's go on over to number three. Number three is up here at the tip or on the dorsal surface of the penis. This is a uh, what we call dorsal penile vein or deep uh, penile vein. It's important for draining blood from the penis after an erection. Okay, now below that you see a large uh, body of tissue and this is called the corpora cavernosa. The corpora cavernosa is a rectal tissue. It fills with blood uh, when the male is stimulated. Again, that's parasympathetic and it helps to engorge the penis and then pinch off uh, the veins that are draining out the penis so that it remains stiff. Now below that, you're gonna see that we have the urethra right here. Now the urethra is divided into a few different parts. We have here something called the spongy urethra, and of course that ends in the external urethral orifice. And that spongy urethra is surrounded by something called the corpora spongiosum. The corpora spongiosum is another part of erectile tissue 
but its purpose here isn't to make the penis erect, rather it's to hold that uh, hole open, hold the uh, urethra open, so that it doesn't get pinched off by the erection. And this is important when you think about what the function of the penis is. It's there to ejaculate semen and sperm uh, during sexual intercourse. So if that tube was pinched off, that wouldn't do much good. So it helps to hold that tube open when the penis is erect. Okay, if we go past here, we said this was all uh, spongy urethra. We go back here, here's gonna be the bulb of the penis, and then that spongy urethra goes through the body wall where it becomes the membranous urethra, and then it travels into something called the prostate gland, number 11, and there it becomes the prostatic urethra. Now remember what we said last time, the prostate gland causes trouble for men as they get older because it enlarges and as it enlarges it will pinch off the prostatic urethra making it hard to void urine because here is our urinary bladder right okay let's talk about other structures which we haven't pointed out so far somewhere in here should be a bulbal urethral gland that's going to be important for producing a little bit of seminal fluid and we'll talk about some other glands in just a minute other structures that are important as well is, this is the rectum, not to be confused with anything else, but also the anus, we're just pointing them out because they're close next to everything else in here. And then we have an area of skin right here called the perineum. The perineum is important because it contains lots of different nerve endings in there that can be important in the human sexual response. And then down below that, of course, we have the scrotum. The scrotum is particularly odd, thinking about guys that have their gonads hanging outside their body. And the reason is, is that we found out that males cannot make sperm at 37 degrees C or 98.6. It needs to be a little bit cooler, and so we have this outpouching called the scrotum that allows the testes to reside outside the body and remain cool. So this is our testis, and then this is our epididymis, and we'll take a look at another view in just a second. Okay, now we're looking at a frontal view of the male reproductive tract with the penis removed. So you can see the penis was right here, but we just took it off. What you can notice right here is we have the gonad right here. The male gonad is the testis. And then coming off of the testis is the epididymis. The epididymis is really important because this is where sperm go to mature and be stored prior to ejaculation. Okay, also coming off of that, we have something called the papiniform plexus, lots of different blood vessels in here, and then this unites with the vas deferens and also the nerves coming from the testis to make something called the spermatic cord. Now the spermatic cord contains blood vessels, it contains nerves, and it also contains the vas deferens, and you can actually see the vas deferens right here, or ductus deferens. The purpose of the ductus deferens is to transport uh, sperm away from the testis uh, up towards the ejaculatory duct uh, up by the bladder. Okay, what do we have right here? We've already looked at this tissue already, but let's talk about it again. Uh, these two bodies up top here are called the corpora cavernosa, and these are large bodies of rectal tissue, again, that help the penis to become erect during sexual intercourse. And then finally right down here, this would be the urethra surrounded by the corpora spongiosum. And remember, the spongiosum helps to hold that urethra open uh, during uh, ejaculation. Okay, now we're gonna take a look at the posterior view of the male reproductive tract. And what you can see here is a lot of that view is hidden by what this thing is right here. This is our rectum, right? But what we can see up here is our urinary bladder, okay, which is covered by peritoneum. And then we can also see over here and over here are our vas deferens or ductus deferens. Remember, these are transporting sperm uh, away from the epididymis and away from the testis up towards the ejaculatory duct, which you'll see in just a minute. So this right here would be the ampulla of the vas deferens or ductus deferens. And the other thing we want to point out right here is something called the seminal vesicle. The seminal vesicle, like the prostate gland, is important in producing some of the secretions that we find in seminal fluid. And last but not least, what I want to point out these tubes right here is these are the ureters. These are how we transported urine uh, from the kidneys uh, down into the urinary bladder. Right, they're not actually part of the reproductive system, but we just want to point them out so you don't confuse them with anything else. Okay, this model is similar to the last one in that it's a posterior view of the male reproductive tract. The only difference is it doesn't have the rectum to get in the way, so we can see more of the seminal vesicles, the prostate gland, etc. So let's just orient ourselves. First of all, up top we have our urinary bladder, okay, and then we had our ureters that empty into that bladder, there and there. And then coming around, you can see number 29, I think it is, that is the ductus deferens or vas deferens. Remember, that's transporting spermatozoa uh, from the epididymis, which was transporting them from the testis. So testis to epididymis, and epididymis to our ductus deferens or vas deferens. 
And then it goes into something called the ampulla of the vas deferens. And this is a large cavernous region up in here. And this unites with another gland right here called the seminal vesicles. So we have the ampulla of the ductus deferens, the seminal vesicles, and they unite in an area called the seminal duct, which is right here. So this actually places the sperm and the seminal fluid into the urethra, the prostatic urethra, which then will go to the membranous urethra and then eventually the spongy or penile urethra. You've now reached knowledge check number one. After hearing the instructions, please pause this presentation and log in to Socrative.com and enter the classroom called NADLAB. Once you do that, enter the identities for structures one through five of the male reproductive system. Once you have identified these structures, you can unpause the presentation and go on to the next section. Okay, now let's take a look at the female reproductive system. The female reproductive system tends to be a bit more complex than the male because it has more jobs to do. Now, like the male reproductive system, the female reproductive system has to produce gametes. Where are those gametes made? Up here in the ovary, which is nicely inside the body and not hanging out where anyone could just kick it. Okay, so the ovary produces oocytes, and the interesting thing about these oocytes is a female is actually born with all the oocytes she'll ever have. Unlike males, they're not making new oocytes every day. Now, the second function of the female reproductive system is to produce hormones, and those hormones are estrogen and progesterone. And again, they're made up here in the ovary, and they have effects on the uterus as well as, as, well as other areas of the body. So that's job number two. Job number three is that once a month, we have to ovulate one of those oocytes. That is under the direction of LH. Uh, we will have one oocyte that will ovulate from the ovary, move up the infundibulum and into the uterine tube or fallopian tube, and eventually move into the uterus. So this is job number three. Job number four is a big one, gestation. Now, unlike chickens who just go and then like crap out an egg uh, and then walk away from it, uh, the human female has to care for and gestate that embryo and later fetus for the next nine months. And that's very complex. We need a place for it to grow, uterus. We also need a connection to exchange nutrients between the mother and the fetus. So that will be something called a placenta that we talk about in the next lab. And finally, job number five, which is technically not part of the reproductive system, but should be considered here as well, is lactation. The female has to provide nutrition even once the baby is born through the process of lactation. Okay, now that we've had an overview of the functions of the female reproductive tract, we're gonna learn about the important anatomical structures using the Atlay dissectable human torso. So starting up front here, we have the pubic symphysis, and although this is not part of the reproductive system per se, we do wanna point it out because this is an area that will have to uh, basically loosen up a lot before that child can be born, and we'll talk about that in the next chapter. Now below that is a structure that seems very small and inconsequential, but is very, very important. And this is called the clitoris. The clitoris contains lots and lots of nerve endings and erectile tissue, and it's very important for the female sexual response cycle. Now the clitoris is homologous to, or similar to, the glans penis in males. Now below that is the other parts of the female external genitalia. We have the labia majora, or the big lips, and the labia minora, or small lips as well. Now coming up from right here, you can see uh, the external urethral orifice right here, where the urethra uh, empties in here, and this is gonna be the urethra of the females, which comes from the urinary bladder. So don't confuse this tube with another tube. Now the next tube over to this side is gonna be the vaginal canal or vagina, and this is where the penis is inserted during sexual intercourse. And then separating the vagina from the uterus is an aperture called the cervix. The cervix is a very narrow opening that is usually closed off by mucus. And this keeps the female reproductive tract sort of isolated from bacteria and stuff like that, except during the time of ovulation. Uh, around the time of ovulation or day 14 of the female reproductive cycle, uh, the mucus plug in here will loosen up and that will allow for sperm that are ejaculated in here to move into the uterus and potentially into the fallopian tube where fertilization can occur. Okay, other structures we should point out up here. Up top, you can see just a little bit of the fallopian tube. We're gonna show that on another model here in a second. And also, just to orient yourselves, we have the rectum here, the anus, and then remember the perineum, which was uh, also had lots of nerve endings. And it's the area between the anus and the genitalia.
Okay, now let's take a look at a frontal or anterior view of the female reproductive anatomy. So we're looking at the external anatomy, which is collectively called the vulva. So again, this is the anterior part of the body. And what you can see up top is we have a little slit right there underneath which we would see the clitoris. And the clitoris, again, is a lot of nerve endings, some erectile tissue, and it's important for the female sexual response cycle. Okay, the mons pubis is this area over here. And we have also the labia majora, the big lips, and the little lips, labia minora, right here. And then somewhere midway around here would be the external urethral orifice. We can't really see it. But down here, you can see the vaginal canal. And this is where the penis would be inserted during intermission. Other areas we should point out, this is the area called the perineum, which is the area between the genitals and the anus. And the anus is located down here. Okay, now let's take a look at a posterior view of the female reproductive tract. So just to orient ourselves, let's point out something. This is the rectum right here. And then up here would be the fundus of the uterus. Remember, the fundus is a rounded area of any organ. And so this is the fundus of the uterus, just like the stomach had a fundus. Other structures you can see here is the fallopian tube. The fallopian tube will transport the ovulated oocytes eventually into the uterus. And then you can see this structure right here, which is a broad, flat ligament called the broad ligament. And that helps to anchor the female reproductive tract into the abdominal pelvic canal. The other structure you might be able to see right here is something called the ovarian ligament. The ovarian ligament basically attaches the ovary uh, to the uterus. Okay, now we're going to take a look at an oblique view of the female reproductive tract so we can see a few more structures we didn't see before. Again, just for orientation, we have the rectum right here. The broad ligament is located in here. This would be the uh, fundus of the uterus. And now we can see, of course, the fallopian tube coming up here. And the fallopian tube has an opening called the infundibulum. And the infundibulum is surrounded by fimbri, which are these little finger-like structures which are touching the ovary itself. So this is the ovary right here. And this is where oocytes are ovulated from. So once a month, an oocyte will be ovulated from the ovary. It will be guided by the fimbri into the infundibulum, and then it will travel down the fallopian tube uh, towards the uterus. Now, in order for implantation to happen, fertilization has to happen about in the first third of the fallopian tube. So the sperm actually have to make it up here and meet that oocyte after it's ovulated. And so that cell can then be fertilized. And by the time uh, the cell has made it to the uterus, it's ready to implant. You've now reached knowledge check number two. Please pause the presentation so that you can identify structures six through 10 of the female reproductive tract. Please enter these answers into the Socrative.com website under the classroom NAD lab. Once you have done this, you can unpause the presentation and go on to the next section. Okay, now we're going to transition on to talk about the histological anatomy of the male and female reproductive tracts. So first, let's start with males. Remember the male gonads were, that's right, the testes. And the testes are divided into something called seminiferous tubules. If you look at a section through the testis, you see lots and lots of these transverse sections through these tubes, and these are seminiferous tubules, and that is where the spermatozoa are made. So in between the tubules, we have an interstitium area where we have our interstitial cells. The interstitial cells, also known as Leydig cells, are responsible for producing testosterone. And they do that under the guidance of LH. Okay, now let's take a look at a 400x view of that seminiferous tubule. So here you can see the seminiferous tubule here. The lumen is in the center. And then outside we have our Leydig cells. Our Leydig cells, also known as interstitial cells, were responsible for secreting testosterone under the guidance of LH. Now, within the tubule itself, you can see that there's different types of cells on the periphery that are in the middle. You don't have to know all the different stages of primary, secondary spermatocytes, but I do want to point out the most immature cells out here are probably going to be our spermatogonia. These are diploid cells that undergo mitosis, and then those cells undergo meiosis to become our spermatocytes. So spermatogonia out here, probably spermatocytes in here. Don't know whether they're primary, secondary, don't worry about that. But then you can see right down here, we definitely have sperm spermatozoa. So you can see the heads of the spermatozoa, and then the tails are protruding into uh, the lumen of the seminiferous tubule. Okay, let's take a look at the anatomy of the penis. This is a cross-section, histological section through the penis. So let's orient ourselves here. First of all, this little gap in here is actually the urethra. This is where we ejaculate from. This is also where a male would urinate from. Above that, we have the erectile tissue called the corpora cavernosa penis. These allow the penis to engorge with blood uh, during sympathetic, sorry, parasympathetic stimulation. And surrounding that is something called the tunica albuginea. Now, you might be wondering what this big gap is right here. And definitely we wondered because we're like, well, you don't see this in 
any of the other histological sections uh, that we found online. But it turns out this is simply the gap or the space between the penis proper and then the foreskin or prepuce that covers the penis. Remember, in guys, we have this foreskin, and the purpose of the foreskin is to protect the glands penis and also lubricate it. So we'll have lots and lots of glands in here that secrete something called sebum, which eventually becomes a cheese-like substance known as smegma. Okay, before we can go look at the histological anatomy of the female reproductive tract, we need to talk about the female reproductive cycle. There's actually two cycles going on here, an ovarian cycle and a uterine cycle. And what's going on in the ovary uh, controls what's going on in the uterus. So first, let's start with the ovary. The ovary is composed of lots and lots of follicles. A follicle, in this sense, is a sac of epithelial tissue that will be surrounding an egg. So there's a lot of different eggs or oocytes within the ovary, and a lot of them start out as these, what we call primordial oocytes, which are located right up here. Now, under the direction of FSH, or follicle stimulating hormone, these follicles grow a little bit. And as they grow, they acquire a follicular layer of granulosa cells. And these granulosa cells are very important, as we'll see in a minute, okay? And as that follicle grows even further, it will develop a internal lumen or vesicle right here. So this is a vesicular follicle, and it has this nice ring of granulosa cells. So as this follicle grows under the direction of FSH, it starts to secrete lots of estrogen. Estrogen is important because it guides the development of the uterine lining. It's basically helping the uterus to thicken in anticipation of eventually having a fertilized egg so that it can implant there. So that's gonna continue under the direction of FSH. This is our vesicular follicle or graphian follicle. And then around day 14 of the female reproductive cycle, we have a surge in luteinizing hormone, LH, and that LH causes ovulation. So ovulation, the oocyte leaves the ovary. Uh, it's ovulated and then hopefully enters the uterine tube right here. Here's the fembrae and infundibulum, and here is our follicle. So as that's happening, let's talk about what's happening to the leftover follicle. So this follicle or ring of cells remains behind inside the ovary without the egg. But it's still very, very important because at this point, the follicular cells are going to start switching over to producing primarily progesterone. And progesterone, think about what that name means. It means go gestation. So it's getting the uterus ready for potential implantation. So that's up here somewhere. We have a nice thick uterine lining. We have lots and lots of uh, secretions of the uterus, which is ready to nurture that uh, potentially implantable embryo. Now, what happens if we don't have implantation uh, soon after uh, that day 14? Well, within the next seven days or so, that um, corpus luteum or yellow body is going to break down into something called a corpus albicans or white body. At this point, it ceases production of progesterone. And without that progesterone, the uterine lining begins to break down and we have menstruation. Okay, now that we've had an orientation to the female reproductive cycle, let's take a look at some histology of ovary. So this is the ovarian cortex, which is the outside of the ovary. And right here, you can see lots and lots of primordial follicles. These primordial follicles are the most immature follicles in the ovary. Uh, they don't really have a discernible follicular epithelium, but under the direction of FSH, a few a month will begin to develop into what we call primary follicles. Primary follicles are a little bit bigger. The egg's about the same size, but now they have a discernible follicular epithelium here. And eventually that primary follicle will begin to transition into a secondary follicle. We have a lot of overlap of terminology here. Secondary follicle can be the same as vesicular follicle or antral follicle or even graphian follicle. But we'll just call this a secondary follicle right here. You can see that it has a nice follicular epithelium right here. And this follicular epithelium will be secreting a lot of estrogen in response to the FSH uh, coming from the anterior pituitary. Here we can actually see the oocyte within that follicle, and then we have a little bit of a fluid-filled antrum in here. Still very, very small. Okay, now what we're looking at is a large graphian follicle or a vesicular follicle. It's a very, very late-stage secondary follicle, and you can tell because it has that very, very large fluid-filled antrum. It indicates it's about ready to be ovulated. So what we have down here is the actual oocyte itself. The oocyte only makes up a small proportion of the follicle, and there's something called the cumulus oophorus surrounding that oocyte, and of course, surrounding everything else, we can see this large, well-developed ring of follicular cells, which are granulosa and thecal cells that are producing our estrogen and later on will produce our progesterone. 
Okay, once we've had ovulation take place, what's left behind in the ovary is something called the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum is just the remaining follicular cells that were surrounding that antral follicle once the oocyte has left and been ovulated. Now these cells are very important because they transform into this corpus luteum, which now begins to secrete primarily progesterone and a little bit less estrogen. This progesterone is very important because it helps to maintain and thicken the uterine lining and prepare that uterine lining for a potential embryo to implant. So this thing's gonna crank out progesterone and estrogen for the next 14 days at least. Uh, and if we have fertilization, it will crank it out for a lot more. If we have fertilization, a hormone coming from the embryo called human chorionic gonadotropin will maintain the corpus luteum for several weeks until the placenta can take over the secretion of progesterone. However, if we don't have fertilization, this progesterone secretion begins to cease around day 14 and the corpus luteum breaks down into something called a corpus albicans. Now, without that extra progesterone hanging around, what's going to happen to the uterine lining? That's right, it's going to break down and menstruate will ensue. So we'll talk more about what happens if fertilization does occur in our next lab on human development. Okay, last but not least, we're going to end up looking at some histology of the uterus. Remember, the uterus was the primary organ of gestation, and it basically has three different layers. On the outside, we have something called the perimetrium, which is a thin layer made of mesothelium. And then deep to that, we have something called myometrium. The combining form myo means muscle, and so this is a big, thick, muscular region that contains exclusively smooth muscle. And that muscle is there to contract when it's time for the baby to be born, and it forces the baby out of the uterus, through the vagina, and out the birth canal. Okay, deep to the myometrium, we have something called the endometrium. The endometrium is there primarily for nourishment of the developing embryo and later fetus. Initially, when that embryo comes down here, it doesn't have much to eat, right? There's no really yolk sac in there to provide much nutrition. So that embryo is actually going to burrow down through the endometrial layer. And this endometrial layer will actually become part of the maternal contribution to the placenta. The placenta, as we're going to learn next week, is this organ that allows for nutrients to be transported between the mother and the developing embryo and later fetus. You've now reached knowledge check number three. Once again, please pause this presentation so that you can identify structures 11 through 16 and enter the identities into the Socrative app. Once you have done that, make sure you answer any remaining questions and then press finish to finish the assessment.